I'm very happy to announce the talk of Breno de Winter. Uh, Breno is a journalist in the Netherlands and he told me um, that he wrote his first computer program when he was six years old, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, his talk will be about hacking data retention and that's not only interesting for, for people like internet service providers, but it's really about human rights and it concerns every one of us, every citizen. And that was a short speech and now let's hand over to Breno. Okay, thank you. By the, By the way, if you want to uh, know bo more about her, she'll talk tomorrow at four o'clock, Saal Drei about robots, so that's interesting as well. Um, but I want to um, talk about you how the bureaucrats fail to save us from terrorism. And I wanted to do that in five steps, today's big five. Um, just really quickly about me, because she told it all already. Um, about what it really means to do data retention. Um, even when I was here, I hear a lot of people that think um, that think wrongly about it and of course it's very good, it will keep us safe. Um, but later on I'll show that um, actually our system or the system we are building is fundamentally flawed and that's of course the first step into a hack. Oh sorry, one of those details. <laughs> yeah, no, indeed it's a little bit louder now, isn't it? Um, and I don't have to shout. Um, I'll show you why the system is fundamentally flawed, and that's actually why we're here. That's the real hack. I mean, exploiting that in the next step is, is kind of simple, um, but it's all about um, showing that it doesn't work. And of course, I've got a whole bunch of circumvention tips, how you can prevent the government from making uh, sure that um, your data goes through their fingers. But before I start, I was here and I found out that there is a, hack, that there is a real terrorist among us. I've got some interesting data for you. And to start, to start with, we found some information that there was this guy who really bought a one-way ticket to Egypt on Swiss uh, International Airlines. And then he went back on a different ticket, really bought on the day of departure on Air France. Well, that's kind of suspicious. But he makes daily visits to the Al Jazeera website. Ooh. And he receives email from Pakistan. Actually, this terrorist is kind of stupid. He, makes it, um, he receives the mail into his um, internet provider account and then forwards it to a different server. So it is kind of stupid. And then uh, this guy also made a booking to Morocco for two days. Then he turns out to make it a seven day trip and ultimately he stays for three whole weeks. Sorry? Yeah, well, you, ne you never know, he might be in training. What do you know? He buys prepaid phone cards in the US. And so the police um, decided to search his house and what did they find? Hacker tools and the Koran. Well, what more can I tell you? I'll get back to this slide in a few minutes. Just quickly about me. I'm 34 years old. I'm a, clearly a technology freak. Um, my focus in life is on sharing knowledge. That's why I write. That's why I give training. That's why I do other things. I've got my own podcast. So if you want to learn Dutch, that's the perfect starting point. No music. <laughs> and I write only about um, voice over IP, security, open source, that kind of shit. And if you want to know more, buy me a beer and I'll tell you everything. <laughs> but there is one thing um, that I wanted to tell you. And the reason I'm standing here today on what we Jews call Hanukkah is that I really care about this subject. Actually, I should be at home celebrating this feast. I am not because I think this is way more important. And I have met the face of terror in my own um, friends because I've lost two friends um, on the September 11th attacks. I've got family in Israel that live very close to the Palestinian border and um, in their surroundings um, people have died. So I know what it means and I support through investigation. Now, having said that, let's get back to the subject. What data retention means? 
we talk about traffic information only. I'm talking to you, you're phoning me, you're sending me an email, you are browsing to this website. We are not looking at the contents of that phone call, email, chat, whatever. That's a big misconception and people go like, oh, oh, I crypt my email. Well, this is not about reading the email. This is about inferences that are drawn based on contact information. That's why I had the slide of the guy who was on the plane to Egypt. The dangerous terrorist. <coughs> if we want to find leaks in a system, we need to know what the system does. Well, with data retention, that is not so very, very difficult. Basically, what we are going to do is to store information. By the way, this is not up for discussion anymore. The European Parliament has decided it. 2007, this will happen. We are storing traffic information. What I told you already, who's phoning who. And basically, when you are online on the internet, in my case, that's kind of simple. I got my ADSL account, the latest one, I believe five years ago. I went online, I've never been on offline since. So that's one record. So that's easy to store. Um, <coughs> of course, if you, if you use your provider's email service, they will store your email communications. And this is not, th not something new. Interpol has been planning this since 2002 when all sorts of lists started to, circul to circulate. Of course, and this is um, for the people who have fought against software patterns, this is a very famous sentence. This is needed to harmonize law. I don't know why you would want to do it, but that's what they want to do. And that's always an argument to push something in Europe. And the plan is that the information comes available for all sorts of investigative agencies. Um, <laughs> process, people went from terror and child pornography to serious crime. And every country can itself, apparently you don't have to harmonize them, but apparently all countries can themselves determine what a serious crime is. I think personally that if somebody lets his dog pee in front of my house, I call it a very, very serious crime. You can store the data for six to 24 months. The plan, that was the plan, but ultimately it was one year. What are we storing then exactly? First, the subscription information. If I've got a phone, who does it belong to? And where does he live? So wh which house should we rate? The connections the person makes, so the numbers he've dialed, the non-successful call, so if I try to call you, and you don't pick up the phone, it's still recorded. The connection times and the person you are calling, so the name, address, and that type of information. If we're talking about the GSM, we're talking about basically all the information on the GSM you have. That's the MZ, the EMI, which is needed to, to make a link between the SIM card and the phone. And the cell ID, so where is your phone at which moment. And by the way, this is nothing new. This is what is happening in many countries already as we speak. In the Netherlands, this is actually a normal way of getting, for police getting to information. So this is not new. What is new is the internet connection. When did you get online? Where do you live? What IP address you use? And the connection times. That sounds pretty innocent, right? <coughs> if you're making a voice over IP call, we're talking about the username or the number. So if you want to Skype me, Breno De Winter, then uh, that is being stored. By the way, I see people taking pictures of um, the slides. They are already online on my website, dewinter.com. Saves you a whole bunch of pictures. Can you take me? Um, 
what type of service you use and um, your login logout times which is by the way also funny because my my actor my way of operating when i get home is um, start up a computer and my skype and my gizmo and my google talk everything is on so and then i go out of the house and i get all these missed calls like hey jerk where were you i tried to call you so that's typically my way of working and of course the IP address of the person you try to call. So this resembles somewhat the traditional telephony. Ultimately this must lead, oh by the way I forgot to tell you we are also going to store email. So all the emails you send through your internet provider will be, the header information will be stored. Ultimately we'll get statistics on that or we won't get them but the European Union will get them and it will also be on the information that was provided to the police and this is very interesting because in the Netherlands we've been chasing for years how many cases of lawful interception we have how many phone calls are being wiretapped how many internet connections are being tapped and so far the Dutch Justice Department doesn't know With this in hand, Dutch the Dutch government has got some brilliant or cunning plans. The first of them is a central collection of all the data. So we make a central data store and there we gather all information. Isn't that sweet? The second, the second thing is that we want to be proactive. So before an attack happens, we want to use this data take out a pattern and then we'll catch the terrorist or the really bad criminal. In Poland they just want to store this for 15 years. In Italy already they are also storing the ID information. If you go to an internet cafe you have to bring your passport and um, they're making copies of that. And the music industry is so thrilled about this idea they want to fight their um, serious crime issue by using this data retention. By the way, in the United States, this was refused. This plan, uh, similar plans occurred and they never made it because they would go like, oh, people will never accept this. This is way too stupid. <laughs> yeah, I must, I must say I'm not a big fan of Bush, but this is one part the government did get right apparently. But the most funny part, and I hate, I hate reading up slides, but I want to make one exception, is for this one. Member states shall adopt measures to ensure the data retained, retained in accordance with this directive and are only provided to the competent national authorities. Can you tell me where in the Netherlands I can find a competent national authority? <laughs> in specific cases, in accordance with national legislation, the process to be followed and the conditions to be fulfilled in order to get access to the retained data in accordance, this is so great, isn't it? With necessity and proportionally requirements shall be defined by each member state. So we make a rule to harmonize everything and then we say like, okay, but each nation decides what they are going to do with it. But there we go. <coughs> but then the most perfect and this is really what i love the most subject to the relevant provisions of union law or public international law in particular the european convention on human rights as interpreted by the european court of human rights ladies and gentlemen privacy is human right Sorry, I had to let that go because um, that's, what, that's the whole thing what we're all about here. And now let's look at why this system is flawed. The problem we're trying to solve is changing. We were about terror and child pornography. Now we are about serious crime. 
serious crime can be defined by each nation. So I'm making a measure, trying to solve something. I don't know what I'm trying to solve, but this is the solution. In the Netherlands, I used to work at Philips. We always had like, we've made this invention. Now we need to find a problem that matches it. <coughs> I asked several members of European Parliament and a member of Dutch Parliament, what does your security analysis look like? Because if I'm asked to help a company, what I start to do is, what is your problem? How can we fight a problem? And then typically what you do is you make an, a list of steps you take and out of those steps you, you take the ones that are the most feasible, right? That, that's how you generally try to fight any problem. There is no such analysis. There are no alternatives that have been reviewed. So ladies and gentlemen, Maybe there's a smarter way to do our job. Maybe this is not the smartest way. <coughs> then there is more. A phone call in itself is not an email. I don't know how many phone calls you make a day and how many emails you send out a day. But I, can't, I can tell you, in my case, it's not related one-to-one. -one. I send out a whole bunch of emails. People estimate that worldwide we have 31 billion emails each year. And in 2006, this will grow up to a staggering 60 billion. Most of those emails are not phone calls that you pick up and you talk to somebody. Now, most of those emails are spam. Most of those emails will never reach my eyes because my spam filter denies them, discards them, or discards them or whatever. And there is no proof whatsoever that the sender of an email is really the sender of an email. This can lead to narrow-minded investigation. And narrow-minded investigation is really dangerous. In the Netherlands, we've had a recent case of a man who served four years in prison, innocently for killing a child. And at the end of the day, it turned out that the guy was never the guy, and the, the guy that was arrested first and was in the investigation first really was the guy who did it. How could this have happened? Because everybody was at a certain point, oh, he must have done it. So let's tweak the evidence in such a way that he is really the guy. He was convicted twice. Court missed this totally. And then, even if this were to work, you still miss out on too much information. I said I write more emails than I phone, but actually I send more instant messaging messages than I write emails. With three Jabber accounts, an Amazon account, a Yahoo account, Google Talk account, and go ahead. Um, that's my primary way of contacting people. Actually, if I'm writing an article and I've got an option of letting two people speak, I have to make a distinction b between calling or sending instant messaging. The guy with the instant messaging wins. There is a lot of information that is exchanged to so-called so and evil and dangerous peer-to-peer -peer networks. You can leave a message in a bulletin board. Who ch uses chat through Silk here? Okay, that's a fair amount already. In a year's time, I'll, I'll bet you it will be doubled or more. Silk is uh, instant mess uh, sorry, is chatting, um, but then encrypted. So you don't know who's talking to who or who's saying what or whatever. You can place hidden messages. This is not something I thought of, but um, this is the American government speaking. You can hide messages in photos, music files or whatever. You have a whole number of voice over IP calls that are never routed throughout Europe. Voice over IP, I don't know if you know, is not telephony. Basically, it's a server telling, oh, you want to talk to him? You can find him there. And then the two parties start calling peer to peer. That means that if the server is in Brazil, 
and this uh, SIP, I see no reason why you wouldn't place a server over there, because it's just as quick to set up a call, you'll never find it out. All uh, VPN traffic <coughs> is basically a collection of, of data that you do not know what it is. And today, if somebody pointed out to me, Paul Byrne, he pointed out to me that he wrote a stack to put TCP IP inside UDP. Well, if you do that, um, how are you going to find out your email? Because we are not looking into the packets. We are only registering the legitimate, legitimate traffic. Well, um, other things, terrorists can go into a train station. One sits at one side of the station, the other sits at, sits at the other side. A Bluetooth connection and you exchange information. Uh, on Unix servers, you've got, of course, talk. Um, I guess you get the picture. There is so much you can think of that you can um, do without being registered that you lose the majority of information. The solution might be to store all, to store all traffic, which IP to address talks to which IP address. Well, Access for All, one of the Dutch internet providers, started to monitor this from September 5th. And they locked until Christmas Day. How do you pronounce it in English? Yeah, trillions or something. No, it's more than trillions. You know, 53,000 trillions or something like that. It's, it's, yes. Sorry? I guess so, yes. Well, anyway, if you were to, uh, if you were to burn them on a CD, you need 47,000 CDs. Well, in the Netherlands, that would be good business because the music industry gets 14 cents per CD, but that's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> The thing is, try to build a data center like this. And this is just one internet provider. We're not talking about the 450 million people that we want to monitor ultimately. Just run a couple of queries um, on such a database or just try to re-index such a database because you found a new way of discovering how you can find a terrorist. And then ultimately, what is relevant information and what is not relevant information. That's the point. And ultimately, this measure will make us insecure. And that's for a very simple reason. I can spend a euro only once. If I buy a bottle of beer, I'm not going to buy that pizza. It's that simple. Now, there are two options. Either we spend all our money on being safe and we die because of lacking health care. Or we say we've got a fixed budget. People are scarce, resources are scarce, money is scarce. And then I need to find the most relevant measure, the measure that gives me the most effect. That's the beer, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, It's a no-brainer that if you miss out on so much information, that we're not more secure. So it stops us from taking effective measures, and that effectively makes you more insecure. And that's not just only me who is saying that. I mean, read Bruce Schneier's newsletter or read anybody who really understands how security works, and that's what you'll hear. So it's a very dangerous, very expensive measure. The level of security will go down or is not as good as it should be. And of course, there will be cases where you can say, okay, we caught somebody, but it's hard to say how many people you did not catch because of this measure. Now back to the suspicious information. I want to disclose myself, I'm this terrorist. I bought a one-way ticket in the middle of the night because my father was admitted to a hospital when he was on holiday in Egypt. And no matter what, no matter how much money it costs, you want to be with somebody who appears to be dying at that moment. 
The trip back was the only flight we could catch back to the Netherlands was Air France at that moment. So that's what we took. The regular visits to the website of Al Jazeera are just as regular as my visits to CNN.com, news.google.com or any other news site. I'm a news junkie and I want to be informed. My email from Pakistan never even reached me because um, this is what I found in my log entries and they were filtered out by my spam filter. The trip to Morocco, I must plead guilty to that. I was there for a small, um, for a small job with a local internet provider. That small job turned out to be a little bit bigger, so I had to postpone my return by a couple of days. And ultimately, it turned out to be three weeks. So that was just doing business. My prepaid phone card, well, if you use your European cell phone, I think you're pretty stupid because making local calls is very expensive. For $10, you can buy a prepaid phone card. So if you don't, it's, it's kind of stupid. Oh, yes, and by the way, I do have hacker tools on my computer. And uh, by the way, who doesn't here? And um, <coughs> I studied theology for three years. And I think it's kind of normal to have at least a Quran to know at least a little bit what you're talking about. I think you're kind of narrow-minded if I only read the Torah, so. Sometimes information is not what it seems. One thing on the Dutch central database, if we are going to build a central database, Jesus, why do we need spyware in the future? You just hack into this one database. We, had a, we have seven agencies or seven centers in the Netherlands that do lawful interception and an audit showed that they were not as secure as they could be. Actually, they were kind of easy to get into the information. What gives me the assurance that this will be protected anything better? Oh, by the way, with friends like this, who needs enemies? That's what we always say in the Netherlands. And even if you were to have all the information in the world, there are two attacks in the world that um, were never discovered by governments. I was here in Berlin three weeks before the wall fell with my high school and I wrote on, um, we had to write this, this, yeah, how do you say, this, this travel story and you would get a grade for that from one to 10. So I, I wrote in that story that you could feel that the government was falling over. And nobody said it, but you felt it. It was just in the air. There was no hard evidence to support it. So I got a three. Three weeks later, I went back with the same story to my teacher and said, like, could you re-evaluate this, please? <laughs> you cannot say the Stasi did not have access to information. They did and they did not see the attack happening. Nowadays in America, oh sorry, in Iraq, the Americans have access to a whole bunch of information trying to prevent attacks. I guess that if they prevented a whole bunch of attacks, we would have heard a little bit of it from the White House. At least I would thought such a fact. So far, I only see dead people. So apparently access to information is not the ultimate solution. If we really want to fight terror, and we're really sincere about it, we need to think as they do. And that's still a very hard case. I was really stunned in July when Mr. Blair from the police in London said the suicide bombers were, th no, the bombers were thinking that they would survive this attack because they bought a return ticket. So why should we circumvent at all? Privacy in itself is a security measure. 60 years ago, the world said to one another, this never again. That is why we have privacy. That is one of the most core values we have. It's the only way to protect ourselves from a government that goes too far in their uh, hunger for control.
and you can protect yourself from honest mistakes. Like the facts I showed, it really can make you look like a terrorist when you really are not one. In the Netherlands, I'm without shame can say that we have a high level of incompetence within our government. They are not able to store their own data. If, a couple of weeks ago, we found a couple of diskettes of our secret servers containing the really secret investigations. They were called state secret and the journalists who revealed them, they might be able, uh, they might be liable for prosecution because he revealed state secrets. Well, who left the diskettes at the place in the first place? A guy from the military police leaked sensitive documents using Gaza. What the fuck is Gaza doing on a computer of the military police? <laughs> and last, <laughs> yes, in the porn. And last but not least, we've got a district attorney talking about porn. A district attorney who thought he had a virus on his computer and left it for garbage at the street. That also contained very sensitive documents and, of course, a whole bunch of child pornography for which he was never prosecuted. <laughs> if such a government is going to maintain my privacy-sensitive data, can you imagine that I'm a little bit scary, uh, scared there? And the final question, who monitors our authorities? The Dutch Justice Department did actually give a response to questions raised in Parliament and they said like, hey listen, if you're not going to do this, we've got one alternative. And that is basically, if we suspect somebody, invade his privacy more. So your privacy is being violated because there are a couple of scum, uh, there's a couple of scum out there that we don't want to violate the privacy of. That's basically the trade-off we made, because security is always a trade-off. Kind of amazing. So how are we going to do this? do this? I don't know if you've got people that you do not like. Go out and war drive, stop in front of their house and do illegal, send out illegal emails or start um, doing things that are not allowed. I mean, it's, this, is not, this is not high tech. I mean, switch open your laptop and try and pick your network. <coughs> Buy a... Um, GMTS or uh, sorry a GPRS or UMTS card in the Netherlands you can buy them anonymously and then you can sit at a certain place oh by the way don't pay with your credit card then <laughs> and take out the battery of the phone the Dutch police is apparently able to also uh, monitor a device even if you switch it off in some cases you still sometimes send out information, so it's, you have still cells picking that up. So you have to really physically remove the battery there. Build your own dial-in intranet, because it's only for internet, and it's only meant for providers. Or set up a closed service. If you're doing voice over IP, only public nets needs to register. So what will stop you from installing asterisk? I don't know if you've ever done it. It's uh, one download, it's an ISO, you uh, place it into your computer, close your computer, it uh, will install automatically and you've got a voice over IP server. It's really a no-brainer. Anybody can do this. And then you're out of the, sc out of the scope, of, out of the radar of the authorities. <laughs> Further, of course, you can always set up a VPN, which is in general a good idea for voice over IP. For email, um, you better use servers abroad or get your own web server. I'm waiting for the day that the government will come to me and say, I want to see your logs because I don't trust you. But ultimately, um, within, this, um, within this regulation, it's not about co uh, companies. It's not about a private servers. It's only about um, internet providers. So you're on the good side there. Use epostmail.org. 
I don't know. I don't know if you know it. It's a perfect system. What it does, it gives you an email address. It will store your email box in a peer-to-peer -peer network, and the emails are sent to the peer-to-peer -peer network. There's just one downside. It's not as reg regular as regular email because it's kind of hard to send out to the traditional world. So everybody should use this system, and that's generally what will not happen. And of course, you can store data or your mailbox on Freenet. Freenet is a system that is also peer-to-peer -peer and has encrypted um, data stores on a whole bunch of computers. So you can't wipe data off the internet. Some general tips what you could do. Be very picky on your internet service provider. These type of regulations show that you have to select your inter internet provider carefully. In the Netherlands, we've got providers that are very privacy-minded, and we've got providers that will give out all sorts of uh, sensitive information for no reason at all. I worked at a couple of providers uh, to do some um, advising, and I've been stunned uh, on how difficult some, some played or how easy some played. So um, be, very, be very careful there. Use VPNs for whatever you can think of. There's a very basic rule in security, and that is if you encrypt data that is not sensitive itself, you increase overall security. Because what is the big deal here? Suppose you have to uh, transport some very ex um, expensive diamonds from A to B. You can do that with police and everything around it, or you can do it by regular mail. If you hire the police to uh, transport an empty box and send it by regular mail, that's the most safe way of doing it, because the volume will add the extra layer of security. So using VPNs for also non-sensitive data is a very good idea from that perspective. Use Tor. Tor is a system that um, will um, transport all the um, internet traffic through a peer-to-peer -peer system. And also use this for the non-sensitive stuff. And where possible, say goodbye to Europe, on, at least virtually. I mean, I wouldn't switch to Europe for the America, that's for sure. But um, virtually, it might be very smart to have a server standing in Brazil or Latin America country and um, do all your business there. Oh, by the way, one funny thing. If you change the ports... I get emotional here. If you take the ports of the system, so for instance, you're sending out email port 26, legally it's not email anymore. <laughs> so all in all, what we've seen is a system that um, fails. Basically because we miss out on too much information and even if, if we were to have all information, it wouldn't automatically give us the right conclusions. It is very easy to circumvent in a whole range of ways. And it's just your imagination that is basically the boundary of, of getting around it. And this is not rocket science, but this is something we can teach each and everybody to do. And I would like to ask you sincerely to go out and help people be aware of the dangers here. We can't have a government crack down on innocent citizens because they are receiving emails. So I would like to ask you to help your neighbors or whoever you can find and do something about it. Set up your own email server. Help your neighbors get on that email server. Set up your own Jabber server. Teach people technology in order to understand how to protect themselves. Oh, we've had that one. And I would like to ask you to take back what is yours and that, that are your human rights and truly fight terror. I am not saying that we shouldn't do anything. In the Netherlands we had a case where the Dutch government did an excellent job. It's called the Hofstad Group. And what they did was they, they suspected a, run, a bunch of people and they um, basically prepared the house and ensured that the people were going to live there. And they had a totally bugged house. 
that is a brilliant way of doing research without violating the privacy of 450 million innocent citizens. So take back what is yours and truly fight terror. I thank you so much. I don't know if there are any questions, but uh, go ahead. Yes. Stop, stop, stop. Coming up. <coughs> Sorry, I, I just want to ask, on the, on the one hand, you're, uh, you're providing Soko Mendes tips, and uh, on the other hand, it's a kind of publicity how, what we should uh, reclaim back. And uh, where do you see the balance between, uh, on the one hand, just uh, making the private uh, private uh, step forward to uh, circumvent and where is the public side to uh, protest for example uh, to uh, or to take back where's where's the balance here well if you if you heard the chemo keynote this morning um, the, the, uh, he told uh, this guy told a story about a law he couldn't prevent in Japan everybody was against it in Europe it's the story is kind of simple um, it's done already the European Parliament has decided. So from that perspective, we are too late already. So the only thing you can do is circumvent in a legal way. And basically what you then uh, underscore is that um, it doesn't work. They miss out on too much data and they start to mis make mistakes. And the only protest you can do is now uh, wait for the next attack to happen and say, you promised that we would be safe. We gave up our privacy and now you didn't make us safe. How's that? That's the only thing we can do right now. So basically showing how inaccurate it is and keep telling that. Keep telling it to people, keep telling it. It did work. When we look at September 11, they, we were not allowed to bring these lit little nail cutters into the airplane because you could hijack an airplane with a nail cutter. <laughs> Nowadays, you can bring a, a nail cutter back in uh, the US because of uh, consistent people saying this is not what it's all about. So if you're consistent and, and persistent, I think you can, um, you can over, uh, undo these type of measures. It, takes a, it will take a long time. I mean, the damage is done already. Was it that lame or was it that obvious? You say we should use, use Tor. Yes. I've made a bad experience with somebody who used Tor on the IRC net. He spread rumors about me, posted my address, telling everyone I, wa um, I will have sex with everyone. And the police told me we can't do anything because we don't have a true IP. True? No, no, that, no, that's true. I mean, if you use Tor and somebody um, uses a, a system like ISC, um, they can say anything about you. He also could have spoofed his IP address. Hiding it, uh, its IP address is not, um, is not the difficult part. The, indeed, it is very easy, uh, very easy indeed to hide your identity. Also this morning in the keynote it was said that it was um, that hiding your identity is not, not the issue. Indeed, even if they could have caught it, the damage to you was done already. So, um, in your case, yes, you could have had justice, um, perhaps. Um, my experience is, I've helped a lot of people after a hack. My experience is that if I'm in the Netherlands and the perpetrator is in Germany, that nothing will happen. So, um, Ultimately, I don't think you would have been helped um, in very many ways. But then it, the question is, what is more important, ultimately? A government that goes too far, or um, in a single case, um, somebody who is not being caught, who might perhaps been caught. I don't know if the police ultimately would have caught him, with, even with an IP address. Breno, one question. Do, do we have any idea why the government did 
or European government did want these kind of measures? Well, that's of course very hard because there are so many governments asking for it. That's, that's really personal. I think it's not factual, but I think governments are in the first place after power. In the second place, they want to show that they are doing something against organized crime and terror. And this is a typical way of doing something about this type of crime without directly and obviously harming people. So you can show like, hey, this is what we're doing, we're strong, we're good. And on the other hand, people don't notice that too much. I think it's an easy way out, but that's, it's a nice security theater, and that's for sure. Hello? Yeah. Hello. <coughs> Sorry. I wanted to add something to, to the lady um, before. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I feel sorry for, for what happened, but um, you have to, I think you have to consider that um, every thing in life uh, has risks uh, associated with it, and um, um, you cannot also prevent someone, for example, to, to make flyers with your photo and um, throw it um, somewhere on the streets um, saying the same thing, or perhaps um, um, distributing them wearing glues uh, into um, post mailboxes. So, um, I mean, um, you never will get 100% uh, security in, in nothing. So, um, and the example I, I just gave with um, um, information disseminated by paper, um, there's nothing really which can be done to, to stop it. So um, it's, it's a pity that things like that happen, but um, it, it's unfortunately part of, of life. I guess anything is dual use. I use my knife to cut my meat. Um, some people use a knife to cut somebody up. Um, all type of um, technology can be used in two ways indeed. Um, so yeah, for the good and for the better. It's I guess how you look at the society as a whole and I still trust that most people are good willing people. That's why I dare to walk such a long distance from my laptop here. Uh, also, I mean, um, life isn't fair, not to, uh, not all the time, so yeah. One more question. You said we should set up a service in, uh, in countries outside of Europe, but I think that's not enough. A lot of servers, for example, I wouldn't say, uh, set up a server in the US or in Korea or in Japan for that matter. So where Not can in Northern I Korea, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Southern too. So where should I set up servers? I'm not sure that Brazil isn't going to cooperate with the European Union. They are trade power. In the, uh, yeah, I always say um, with Malayaki, the latest prophet dies, what, uh, what in the future will happen is very hard to predict, but I guess in Latin America, as an example, are, are nations that are very liberal towards the internet, um, with very little regulations. The good thing about um, placing a server is that you can do it um, as virtually as you want to do it, thanks to technologies like Zen, for instance. So you can place a server from one data center to the no, uh, other data center overnight. And the only thing you have to change is DNS. So I, I really th don't think it's such a big problem if you, um, if you go abroad virtually. I guess those were all the qu questions so far. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>